Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We have in the past talked a little bit about distinctions for certain cognitive functions, the mental processes that make up the building blocks of your personality type. In a past podcast, it's actually, I think, been a couple of years now, way back in maybe even 2015, when we talked about some distinctions between the two intuitive processes, extroverted intuition and introverted intuition, when we went through a series that defined intuition in general. And then a little later on, we had a podcast called The Sensing Personality Types, where we talked about the distinctions between the two sensing processes, extroverted sensing and introverted sensing. But we realized that even though we've talked a lot about cognitive functions and the judging cognitive functions, the four mental processes that help us determine evaluation and worth and make decisions. We've talked a lot about them. I don't think we've ever done a compare contrast series on the on the judging functions like we did with the intuitive processes. So we thought, hey, better late than never. Why don't we just go ahead and do that now? And so what we want to do is have a short series on doing a little bit of deeper dive into these functions, these thinking and feeling processes, so that those of you who are trying to, say, determine your personality type and trying to figure out how these functions are similar and different, and maybe you know your type, you've got your best fit type, but you're just trying to create a little bit more fidelity in these distinctions between how you're using them and how other people are using them. We want to serve you with a a couple podcasts on some of those distinctions. So today what we're going to do is dive into two of those judging processes, right? Those, uh, well, no, that's what their technical names are. Usually we (laughs) call them decision-making processes is like an easy access point, but they're technically called judging processes. And we're going to look at the difference between introverted thinking or what we call accuracy and extroverted thinking or what we call effectiveness. Yeah, so this judging process, this is going to be that that third letter in your dichotomy. You know, you've got that four-letter code in the Myers-Briggs system. Like, for example, I'm an ENFP. That F stands for my judging process. That's That really clues me into what I'm using to make my decisions in my life, which is feeling-based. F stands for feeler. The other letter that could be there is thinker. So if you're a thinker in the Myers-Briggs system, this will apply to you. You're going to be using one of these two styles of decision-making or judging processes to make your decisions in your life. Right. So as an ENCP, I'm using a thinking process, but I'm using a different thinking process than, say, an ENTJ would. So our recommendation is you go check out what we call the CAR model on personalityhacker.com to find out more information around how you figure out what your decision-making process, your judging process is for your personality type and look a little bit into what those cognitive functions are. But we're going to we're gonna do these podcasts assuming you have a little bit of this information. We're going to make the assumption that you are familiar enough with cognitive functions that you know what we're talking about when we say introverted thinking and extroverted thinking. So that's kind of the baseline we're coming from. If if you are not familiar with those, please feel free to go do a little bit of research online on our website or other websites to determine how to, you know, how to figure out what your function stack is. But we are, we're going to make the assumption that we're all up to speed (laughs) on these podcasts. So, and like we mentioned, we've already done the intuitive and the sensing processes. We've done a little compare and contrast on those. And so please feel free to check those out as well. The search terms, I believe, for that are uh, what is intuition and the other podcast would be the sensing personality types. Yeah. So just a quick note. Again, we're if you're a new listener, because we get new listeners all the time. So if you just joined us for the first time, we don't usually go this technical on all the podcasts. Often our podcasts have a lot of personal growth topical elements we talk about and we weave personality types throughout those. This one's going to be a little bit more technical, so that that little bit of knowledge behind you is going to be helpful here. But just understand, if you go back to listen to our other podcasts, they don't always go down this road in such a deep way. We're doing this for maybe more of the enthusiasts that are a part of the audience. So if you're an enthusiast and you kind of know what we're talking about, this is going to be really powerful for you. And if you're just new, just understand, hang in there. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about might be interesting to you. And as you start to learn and unpack this, this information is going to become even more powerful for you. If you are new, let me just give you a quick reference point, just so you have a sense of what we're talking about. Anybody in the Myers-Briggs system that ends with the last two letters of TP, so all TPs in the Myers-Briggs system will be using that cognitive function of introverted 
thinking. So introverted thinking sometimes is written as a shorthand of TI. We've nicknamed it accuracy. Everybody that uses TP has that as their primary way they make decisions in the world. If you have TJ as the last two letters of your Myers-Briggs type, then you're going to be using the cognitive function called extroverted thinking. Sometimes it's written shorthand with a capital T, lowercase e. We've nicknamed that effectiveness. So these are just a little bit of a framework for you to understand the two cognitive functions we're using. If you're brand new and you're trying to get up to speed quickly, that gives you almost like a map legend to what we're going to talk about today. Mm, yeah, I, I think the people who are up to speed are always like, why do you have to say all that stuff? And the answer is because we have a lot of people who this will might be their very first podcast. So thank you very much for sticking with us when we give people a little bit of context to those of you that are already familiar. All right. So you ready? Let's you want to deep dive? Let's do it. OK. All right. So the thinking processes are both judging processes that focus on impersonal criteria. Now, we've done other pieces of content. We recently recorded a video that talked about this concept called polarities, which are the pairing of opposite functions. And so if you're a thinker, you're always going to have a feeling process that is very influential to you. And that and the vice versa. If you're a feeler, you're going to have a thinking process that's very influential to you. So those of you who are feelers, this is going to be interesting to you as well, because you do have a thinking process in your cognitive function stack. You have a thinking process that's either your 10-year-old or tertiary process, or your three-year-old and inferior process. And so sometimes when you're trying to figure out your best fit type, it's not just determining which is your favored cognitive functions, but also the ones that are influencing you that aren't as powerful, but are still basically whispering in your ear. So even if you're a feeler, this might be a very interesting podcast to you because you're trying to identify what your thinking process is or just get more nuance and flavor around it. So all thinkers that in the in the Myers-Briggs system, all everybody who has a T is using, as Joel mentioned, either introverted or extroverted thinking, depending upon if you're a TP or a TJ. And that means that regardless of whether or not you're a TP or TJ, you are generally using impersonal criteria to make your decisions. And by impersonal, we mean things that aren't just about how how events, th- you know, decisions, etc., strike individual humans or collective groups of humans. That's all personal. How is this going to impact me? How is it going to impact other people? Those are personal criteria. Impersonal criteria means that might be one node in the system. That might be one thing you're taking into account, but there are many other things to take into account at the same time. There's resource, there's timelines, there's environmental impact. There are lots and lots and lots of different components that all feed into decision making for you because people are one element, but they're not always the most trusted source of how something's going to pan out. Thinkers recognize on a fundamental level that people are fickle. We come with lots of different biases. We come, a lo- we come with a lot of things that we want to believe are true. And if we rely only on human metrics, if we rely only on how people are feeling about things, then yeah, we might have for a short amount of time a more caring environment, but ultimately we'll put too much power in the hands of people's wants and desires and not enough in actually how these things roll out in the real world. We have to see how human influence pans out in reality. And if we don't take those metrics into consideration, we actually don't end up creating sustainable systems that people like. We end up creating sustain we we create short-term systems that people some people temporarily like and not everybody gets served. So th- thinking criteria is not just because it's impersonal doesn't mean it's going against human interest. It's actually yet another way to feed into human interest by recognizing that it's more than just how we're feeling about things that impact us. We have to take these impersonal, you know, data points into consideration. So it's important to remember that if you're a thinker, you are not a robot. You are not somebody who's only looking at the bottom line. You're not a person who doesn't care about how people are impacted by things. You you may care very strongly how people are impacted by things. And you recognize that we're not just impacted by emotions. We're impacted by physics and resource and all these other components. So it it's it's a little bit of a nuanced difference between how some people think it, uh, about thinkers to remember that being a thinker is actually looking at things like sustainability. It's thinking about the long game, long-term implications, and that feeds back into a better experience for humans. 
There are a lot of memes online that look at thinking types and create these stereotypes around how they might be, you know, despots or masterminds that are like tenting their fingers and saying mwahaha about how they can get away with things. And those aren't thinkers, those are sociopaths. And there's a distinction between those two things. You might be a thinker and a sociopath. That might happen to be the center of your Venn diagram, but you could also be a feeler and a sociopath. And that just looks a little different. So we're not talking about sociopaths here. We're talking about people who just are looking at different metrics for measuring. So let's get into the actual metrics. If thinkers, both styles of thinkers, introverted thinking people using introverted thinking or people using extroverted thinking, what metrics are they looking at? Because really what's happening here is the two styles of thinking are taking different types of impersonal criteria into account. Now, the introverted and extroverted tags or things we put to these two, you know, the the thinking judging function are technically called attitudes. So you have an attitude to your judging function. You're a thinker and you have an extroverted attitude or an introverted attitude. That's why it's called extroverted thinking or introverted thinking. Extroverted thinking, like we said, we've nicknamed effectiveness. Introverted thinking, we've nicknamed accuracy. So what is the actual criteria that effectiveness is looking at? Let's start there. Let's start with effectiveness, extroverted thinking, sometimes written shorthand, capital T, lowercase e. What impersonal criteria is a TJ or an effectiveness user looking at? So it's important to understand what those attitudes mean. Extroverted means it's looking at the external world. Just look at extrovert and think external and look at introvert when we get to introverted thinking as internalized. We're talking about a distinction between the outer world and the inner world. Anything that's extroverted or externalized is the world around us and anything that's introverted or internalized is the world inside of us. So extroverted thinking with an extroverted attitude means that the metrics and the criteria used to determine the value and worth of something is going to be based on external or extroverted measurements. So what happens in the outside world when it comes to thinking and impersonal criteria? Well, that's where we get things done. That's when we're looking at real world resources. We're looking at money. We're looking at time. We're looking at timelines. We're looking at people as resources. We're looking at anything in the external world that is playing out to create an ultimate end game because all thinking processes want to see impact and effect. That's really what they're gauging for. Well, all of them are actually engaging that, right? All the thinking and feeling processes are looking for impact and effect. They're trying to determine what we should be doing right? What should we be thinking? What should we be feeling? What should we be doing? All of the judging processes have should statements automatically attached to them because they're decision making, right? We're trying to determine what is the best course of action. So outcomes and end games are very important to all of the judging processes, but they look at them a little different. And extroverted thinking is the most tapped into how something plays out in the real world based on all of these different, different determinations. What's the return on investment? How's the money doing? What kind of timelines are we looking at? How much time did we pour into something? Did we learn from it? Did the goal that we wanted to get accomplished get accomplished? Ultimately, the question that extroverted thinking is asking is what works? And it's a very simple question to a very complex process. Lots of different things go into extroverted thinking to create an outcome that works. And it can be very flexible. What works in one context may may not work in another context. So extroverted thinking gets very good at taking in environment and context. Why did it work over here? Why didn't it work over there? What are the nodes in the system that are making something effective in one one context, but not effective in another context. How do we have to manage people? People are a rogue element. What are the kinds of things that we need to implement in order to make sure that people are operating at their highest potential? What kind of ROI are we looking at? Are we looking at something that is a quick gain or are we looking at something that has long-term gain? ROI can be measured in multiple different ways. What's the 80-20 on it, right? What's the 20% that gets 80% of the results? What's something that's sucking 80% of your time that's only getting 20% of your results? So it's very much tapped into all of these different measurements in the outside world that let us know whether or not the project we're working on, the goal we're trying to accomplish, whether or not this is actually even going to accomplish anything, and whether or not it's worth our time and attention. So there's this concept in the book, Getting Things Done, 
with uh, who, who wrote this book? I can't all of a sudden remember the Dave, uh, is it David Allen. David or, Allen. Is, I think it's David Allen. Yes. I hope I'm right on that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm saying it live on the air. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he wrote a book called Getting Things Done. And in the book, he talks about the difference between a project and a task. He talks about how most people go through the world uh, thinking that they're working on projects or thinking they're working on tasks, which are actually projects. So for example, I'll just give you this example. If you have to get the oil changed in your vehicle, your car, most people are like, oh, that's a task on my to-do item list, a task I have to do. So they'll write down and get the oil change of the car. But really, that's a project, ultimately, because it's got multiple tasks underneath it. So it's not just about getting your oil change. It's about you've got to call the, the company where you're going to have this happen and, and schedule an appointment. You've got to clear your schedule and take off time from work or from your family to go drive it to the place to get the oil change. You've got to sit in the waiting room and actually pay the money to have it done and wait for it to actually happen. Then you have to drive drive the car home and and get it back to your house. So there's multiple tasks, for example, underneath the project of getting the oil changed in your car. And what extroverted thinking is really good at doing, it really understands this because it's looking at the outside world on things, how things happen, how, how results happen in the outside world. Extroverted thinking has this talent, this natural talent for instinctively understanding the difference between projects and tasks and being able to take projects and break them down to the task level in a sequence of this A has to happen before B happens, before C happens, because C can't happen before A or it's out of order. And it's, I mean, it, you know, getting your oil change is a very basic project that I just broke out for you. But extroverted thinking can get very complex in the types of projects and resource management it can take on because this is so instinctive to how this function works, how this decision-making process works for TJs in the Myers-Briggs system this almost comes naturally. It's a natural talent that can be developed with more and more skill over time. So we see the stereotype of a lot of TJ type personalities using extroverted thinking in the world of government or business or management or leadership. There's a stereotype that these are the types that gravitate toward those. And there's some truth to this because this is, this is a process, this mental process, this decision-making process of extroverted thinking does very well in a world that a lot of resource needs to be managed. When things have to happen, extroverted thinking tends to know what to do and what to do when. And when it gets really complex, this is the process that does it the best, I believe, in my opinion. And so oftentimes, uh, when an extroverted thinking person, somebody using that effectiveness process, is in a business environment, they can, they can oftentimes rise quickly through the ranks because it's so impressive how they can look around and see all of the resource available. They can see all of the people who, you know, sometimes can be categorized as resource in, in that context. They are still people, but they see them potentially as a resource that could be utilized toward an effect or an end game. And they can weave all of that together, almost like an orchestra conductor, and get a desired result. And so this can create a lot of, you know, success very quickly for an extroverted thinking person, somebody that's a TJ in the Myers-Briggs system, to create success for themselves and rise through the ranks quickly. Because their mind is always looking at these measurements, they get really good at making quick decisions based on stuff they've already seen before. Like uh, if you were going to get your oil changed, a person of a different type might go all the way across town to get their oil changed because it's like fi- they have a $5 off coupon. But somebody using extroverted thinking would also calculate in not just that $5 off coupon, but what's the gas I'm pouring into it? What's the extra time I'm pouring into it? And then determine, you know, I, ha- I might have a $5 off coupon, but that oil change place is right by my house. It's not going to cost me an extra 30, 45 minutes to travel to and back. I'm uh, My gas might be an extra three bucks. So that's eating into my $5 off coupon. So like the ROI on that is just not reasonable. So I'm going to go, even though I have a $5 off coupon, I'm going to go to the oil change place right by my house. I'm not going to go across town to, to capitalize on this coupon. It's those kinds of little metrics that they're constantly thinking about in their minds. What's my ROI? What is the, the, what is the resource going in and what's the resource coming out? And like you said, Joel, that's a very small expression of it. Now think about doing this all the time, having this be a way of life, a way of thinking, a constant measurement that's going on all the time to determine what is the best course of action. And what ends up happening, I think, a lot of times is that people who use this process don't just know these decisions for themselves. They know what other people should be doing. <laughs> like, you shouldn't be going across town. I wouldn't use that $5 off coupon if I were you. I mean, you can if you want to, if it makes you feel happy. And there's this sense of knowing what people's 
potential is, knowing how they can be used as a resource, trying to bring out their potential, constantly looking for A players, constantly looking for people who do, you know, do certain things well, how they, you know, what their areas of talent are and being able to, you know, put people, quote unquote, in the right bus and the right seat. These are all things that are very obvious to an ever, you know, growing or increasingly sophisticated extroverted thinking. Now, when extroverted thinking is not being done well, it's a desire to get an outcome by taking shortcuts. And that's one of the biggest challenges that extroverted thinking has is that because it's looking to streamline everything, unfortunately, it can get caught up in the world of shortcuts. It can try to find that end result with as little you know, as little effort as possible and sometimes no effort. So one of the biggest umbrages I think people take with extroverted thinking is not the process itself, but when it's being used in an exploitative manner. Because there's there's no such thing as a shortcut, truly. If you're taking a shortcut, that means that you're doing it on the backs of other people's resource. And you might think that that's perfectly justifiable, right? It's their resource, not yours. But that doesn't mean that the resource wasn't poured into it. It just means that you didn't pour the resource into it. And oftentimes the resource that you pour into things are what you're using to gain extra insight and extra savvy and extra learning so that when you get the result you want, you'll be ready for it. So one of the challenges that extroverted thinking needs to do really implement and grow into is being willing to do the work, right? Not not just to streamline. Streamlining is important, right? Like we love that extroverted thinking streamlines our world. I love it anyway. I'm very glad it happens. But when it's when it goes from a perspective of streamlining into a perspective of skipping steps or trying to get gains that it didn't personally earn, that's when we see the exploitative nature of extroverted thinking. So I'm not going to talk about the exploitative nature of extro- extroverted thinking here, but I'm going to give an example. We've nicknamed this process effectiveness for a reason. And we believe that effectiveness is a much better word than another word that we tossed around in the early days, which was efficiency. Because I think the temptation for extroverted thinking or an effectiveness person is to become efficient over becoming effective. So let me give you an example of what I mean here. If you've ever called into a major corporation like Verizon or something for customer service help, often you're confronted with a phone tree where you've got to select from a bunch of different numbers to get to the right department to talk to either the person you need or get your problem solved. And how I see this is this is a very efficient way of getting people to customer service because you're having them pre-select things on their side before they talk to a real person on the other end. I think it's very efficient and I think that is an efficient move. However, it may not be as effective as having people call in and actually talk to a live person where they can... Maybe there's it's not as efficient. It's a little bit more wasteful because they're talking to a live person in, in real time and they're not pre-selecting the right person to talk to. The, the person they called into has to sort them manually, basically, and it's using human capital. So it's burning a little bit of resource in order to do that. However, think about the effective thing is having the effective metric here for, for, for this scenario when someone's calling in a customer service is for a delighted customer, someone that's really happy with the customer service experience. And if they call in and talk to a live person, even though it burns more resource, effectively, the effective outcome may be a higher number of satisfied customers because they feel like there's a human touch, a human element to the experience right out of the gate. So that's just a quick example of how maybe somebody that's using this process... Now, I'm not saying all these, these phone trees are always set up by effectiveness users or extroverted thinking people. But this is just to give you some kind of an external world example of how this might play out. An efficient, an efficient decision would be to have them go through the phone tree to save your, your company money so that you can recoup those costs and save that resource for yourself. And it almost seems maybe sometimes like it's a resource waste to have a human on the other end of that phone. But if you're taking the metric of effectiveness, the ultimate effect of what are we actually trying to do here? What's the end result? We want delighted customers. We don't want to just save money for the company. We also want delighted customers so this company can grow and go, grow into the future. Then the effective thing ultimately might be to have humans on the other end of the phone line when someone calls in. So that's just a basic example just to kind of give you a sense of what this looks like. By the same token, you might have gotten to a place in your company where that's untenable. True. Like you simply can't do that. And if that's the case, then the effective thing is to pivot and change tasks um, or change your how you've set that up. So it really is about... 
it's about remembering that there are all these different components that that efficiency might not take into consideration because efficiency is more about the process, whereas effectiveness is more about the ultimate impact at the end. And so when people want to be like TJs want to be efficient, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make the process as fast as possible or as little um, outpour, you know, out uh, going as possible to be able to get a higher return. And there's nothing wrong with thinking in those ways as long as you don't lose the impact at the end as your ultimate gauge. Effectiveness should be the gauge and efficiency should be a tool you use to get to effectiveness. One of the challenges that extroverted thinking comes up against as well is that there is what we call the acceptable loss principle. (laughs) You were just about to say that, weren't you? (laughs) I I call it spillage. Yeah. (laughs) I saw you uh, tagging something. I'm like, I'm just going to say this one little piece first, but that was where you were going too. Did you want to talk about that? No, no, please keep going. Okay. So the the spillage, the uh, acceptable loss element that extroverted thinking thinks in, this is not always a bad thing. This can feel very icky to other types, this idea of acceptable loss. Like, oh, you mean like individuals aren't important? You're just going to piss me off in order to like, you know, give more money to your shareholders or whatever? Like, I'm your acceptable loss? But we actually need people to be able to think in some terms of acceptable loss. And the reason why is because not everything is going to work out in an idealistic way. Not everything and everyone can be saved in all contexts. So what has to happen is somebody's got to be able to make the tough call to determine what is going to have the best impact possible, recognizing that not everything can be accounted for, because that's idealistic. It's idealistic to think that we can live in a utopia where everything works out exactly as we want it to. And extroverted thinking is willing to make those hard decisions that tries to get the best impact possible with the least amount of spillage, but they they have an acceptable spillage amount. When that acceptable spillage amount goes too high, when the uh, you know the the amount of um, losses they're willing to take becomes unacceptably high for just the general situation, when it becomes untenable, that's when extroverted thinking has lost its way. Yeah, I'm watching Ken Burns' documentary recently on the Vietnam War. And at some point during the Vietnam War, basically the metric that the generals were using for success in Vietnam was a kill rate, a kill ratio, actually. And they said, well, we've killed 100 Viet Cong in this battle to 10 The ratio is 100 to 10, you know, 100 Viet Cong to 10 American lives being lost in the war. And the one commentator on the on the documentary said, yeah, but the Americans that that their sons or daughters died in the battles, they don't care about the 100 on the the kill rate. They care about the 10 that died, their their personal sons and daughters. And this is where I think when you look at something like warfare, where maybe, you know, the stereotype is that a lot of generals are using effectiveness or extroverted thinking, sending men or women into battle. It's this idea of acceptable loss. Yes, we're going to lose some lives, but we're ultimately going to win the battle or a war. And the the question is, make sure that that war and that battle needs to be fought in the first place because that loss actually is a real cost. It's not just like, oh, yeah, there's a little acceptable spillage or some acceptable loss of life here. It's any loss of life seems to be unacceptable for the people losing their lives, right? And so I think that's the extreme version where it can be other other types can look at that and go, wow, I, can, I could never conscience making those decisions for any loss of life at all. Whereas I think uh, extroverted thinking, they, they're okay with that, not because they like the loss of life, but, but they understand that anything you do in life, and that's an extreme example, I understand that. But even on less extreme examples, well, we have to lay off this many people in our company to save the company because the company's the higher the higher ethic here. If everybody stays here on on the payroll, we're not going to be able to all be going for it. So there's going to have to be access, acceptable loss going forward. And again, I know that we're in a world right now where that feels almost unacceptable to anyone. Right now, at the culture we're in and the time and period we're in, any loss seems unacceptable to a lot of people. But I'm just giving you an example of the extreme version of this so you understand how the mindset is working. Somebody that uses this process, this is how their mind is wired. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, they'll make they'll make choices that the rest of us are are incredibly uncomfortable or possibly unwilling to make. And therefore us like my unwillingness to make a choice, like what if somebody came and declared war with us, right? And we're like, well, no, no human loss is acceptable. 
you know, we're not going to fight this at all because no human life is loss is acceptable. Well, then we're all toast. Right? So it's like that's just how reality works. And exactly. so we want people who are willing to make decisions that are very uncomfortable that the rest of us maybe can't make. And we want to make sure that the those choices, the acceptable loss is a that's like a worst case scenario um, when it comes to human lives, obviously. But when it comes to like pissing off a couple you know, I'm, I'm almost kind of getting to this point, too, now that we have a business the size that we have. I'm recognizing we can't make everybody happy. And there's going to be, like, when we when we create some programs, it's not going to be a fit for everyone. And when we do certain podcasts, not everybody's going to like what we say. And, like, you just kind of get to a point where you're like, that's that's acceptable. That's because we're trying to get something major accomplished. And it's just not always going to be a fit for everyone. And that's all right. Like we can allow those people to maybe have icky feelings around that. Like they might not like us anymore because they had an experience that wasn't ideal for them. And that's just what happens. So you kind of get this sort of realistic understanding that people are, the situations are too complex to try to make everything perfect for everyone. So let's do what we need to do to get our ultimate end game accomplished. And I think one of the things that extroverted thinking can do to ensure that that is as positive as possible is to be very deliberate about the impact they want to make. What is the ultimate end game? When you say what works, are you being conscientious and careful about the project itself? Not just what works, but what is good and works. Like what is ultimately what we want to accomplish for humanity, really. Not just me, not just my shareholders, not just, you know, like power or whatever. Like all of those things, none of those things are bad, right? Like all of, if you are a positive influence in the world, you want to have as much power as possible because you can have more impact that way. You can have more positive impact, but make sure you are clean, in your conscience about what you're trying to accomplish. And then you will have those moments of conscience when you're thinking, you know, acceptable loss, you should take a hit for that. Anytime there's a, anytime you have acceptable loss, it should be a hit. It shouldn't be demoralizing. It shouldn't cut the legs out from under you. You shouldn't like, you know, no longer be able to move forward, but you should feel it. And that's where, of course, that other side of the polarity of introverted feeling comes in, which we'll talk about polarities in another time. But um, so I think that that's an important thing to remember about extroverted thinking. Yeah. Let's start to contrast this now against the other thinking judging function. So this is on the other side of the attitude spectrum. This is not extroverted. This is introverted thinking, sometimes written with a capital T lowercase i as shorthand. And we've nicknamed it accuracy. So accuracy, again, is a thinking process, but it's not so much about what works, what gets accomplished things in the outside world. This is more focused on ensuring that the, the internal metrics, the internal thought processes that you're making your decisions are clean and without corruption. And this is much more in- interested in the process rather than the result. This is much more interested in making sure the thinking is clean, there's no conflation, concepts are separate and complete and stand on their own. And this type of thinking is very different from extroverted thinking in that what it's focused on is more about making sure that we're, we have integrity in the process rather than just the outcome at the end. Yeah. In fact, sometime out, sometimes outcome at the end isn't interesting to introverted thinking at all. Like sometimes the impact... Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Joel's saying that because I use introverted thinking. <laughs> but the impact at the end sometimes like doesn't even fit into it yet because the process itself needs to be clean. And so obviously, again, this is an introverted or internal attitude. So it's metrics that go inside and therefore it creates a certain subjectivity. Now, extroverted thinking the results are on the outside. Everybody can look at it. Most people can measure it, even if they're measuring it with different you know, metrics or whatever. There's a certain objectivity to extroverted thinking and the, and the things it's trying to create, the impact it's trying to create. There's a pass-fail metric to it. Yeah. Did it work or did it not work? Yeah, exactly. And you can argue about that, but still, it's in the outside world. We all look at it. It's, like, it's, a, it's an object in the outside world. Introverted thinking is incredibly subjective. It's about what's making sense to me as an individual. It's about what's logical and, and, and passing my criteria of analysis to me as, a, as an individual. So it takes on a very subjective nature. That said, the subjectivity of it is not based on 
personal criteria like what I'm feeling, right? It's not it's not so subjective that it's not taking in information from the outside world to use as data points. So what introverted thinking is attempting to do is it's attempting to to root out the cleanest information possible. What do we know to be empirically true? What do we know to be true on a level that removes all of the things that we want, right? All of our end game desires. Introverted thinking is actually the desire in and of itself. That clean data is its own desire. It's not a desire to make people feel good. It's not a desire to get everybody's needs met. And it's not a desire to make something like work in the outside world or have pass fail criteria. Like it kind of doesn't matter. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is if the information and data itself is pure. So what does that mean? All right. Well, one of the major ahas that I've had around thinking, uh, introverted thinking recently, because I mean, it's my own process. So it's sometimes difficult to explain your own processes because they're happening, you know, they're kind of happening to you. <laughs> they're like, it's sort of happening and you are barely aware of it. And sometimes you can watch it, but it's really difficult to express. And one of the things that became super clear to me recently is that I just like extroverted thinking on an unconscious level is is always measuring things. It's always measuring resource. It's unconsciously always calculating and doing the math of like, okay, is it better to use a $5 off coupon? Is it better to stay, you know, closer to home and the oil change? Like it's just unconsciously thinking those things all the time to a place where it's not even watching it anymore. It doesn't even know it's doing it. One of the things that introverted thinking is doing is it's always going back and looking at whatever code or programming got written in your mind. Like pretend your mind's a computer with lots and lots and lots of lines of script. Some of that programming was given, in fact, most of that program was given to you. That's effectively what being raised is, is having a bunch of concepts and information and data be dumped into you. Uh, Bill Burr, who's a fellow person who uses introverted thinking, says that we download all of our BS into children's pristine little hard drives. And that's what we're doing. We're constantly downloading information. And so those are all lines of script. And what introverted thinking does on an unconscious level, especially when it's being used well, is it's, it's almost unconsciously but constantly going back and reviewing those lines of script. Can I know that to be true? How much information in that line of script is corrupt? How much information is unnecessary? How can I know that to be true pitted against all the other lines of script that I have vetted? And so it, it can be kind of difficult when these ideas and concepts are merged together. There's a phrase that I've always loved, which is that um, neurons that fire together wire together. So when you're thinking two different things at the same time, they start to get wired together inside of your mind. Your mind thinks that they're the same thing. And one of the things that introverted thinking is always looking for is those those neural pathways that have wired together because they had an original source of uh, of, of like relationship. And so a lot of those neural programs that are firing together and wiring together are two totally different things. So what introverted thinking is attempting to do is looking for those false conflations. What are the times that my, my pieces of code or script have gotten fused together and they're actually two different things? In fact, they might have nothing to do with each other. And one of them may be true and the other one may be completely false. But I'm thinking the false one is true because it's firing with one that is true. So going back and looking at those lines of code, those lines of script, and trying to remove those conflated uh, uh, elements, those things that are fused together that should not be, and then surgically removing those lines of script that are corrupt. That is an unconscious pro process for introverted thinking, and you're doing it all the time. Now, one of the ways to do that better is to get more information, right? To actually data dump yourself, to get as much information as humanly possible, and then sort through it very quickly, looking for the pieces of information that you can trust and what you can't. And when you do that, now you have things to compare and contrast with inside of your own mind, things that you can now go, okay, so my original assumption was this thing. That was my original belief. But now I've got all these other pieces of information that are contradicting it. Now I can get to work. Now I can look at almost like, not ledger lines, but I can look at these pieces of information, compare, contrast them, and determine which one actually makes more sense to me. This is one of the reasons why people who use introverted thinking oftentimes 
can't stop learning. They have to get more information because the information they're feeding inside of their mind is their primary tool to do what they do best, which is root out bad data. Now, this is something that is baffling to everybody else (laughs) because most people don't have this level of rigor in their own thought. And because introverted thinking is, it is ruthless to its own thinking processes. Like no thought is safe. Well, it's also baffling to introverted thinking why other people don't do this. Like, how could you allow these conflations to happen? How come you're not ruthless as well? Why aren't you paying attention to all this and allowing, you're allowing your mind to get dirty and unclean with all of the data you have floating in there? Yeah. One of the most baffling things to me is when I present a piece of information to another person and I can tell it struck them. Like, I can tell that that made sense to them. And instead of thinking about it, they immediately go to an autoresponder or they they pivot or they throw in like an irrelevant piece of information or say some sort of um, like like soundbite to be able to hear themselves re uh, sort of re what is the word reinforce reinforce. Thank you to reinforce the belief that they wanted to believe when I observe that happen. I'm almost dumbfounded. Like, I'm shocked that a person could do that. And when somebody tries to feed me bad information, like I find out, like somebody did this to me at a party one time. And, um, I, I discovered that they had, uh, they had been an editor on one of my favorite movies of all time, that they had been part of the editing process. And the claim was that they ed- their, their company edited this movie. Like, that's that was their claim. And I was like, that is one of the best edited movies of all time. Now, this was like... This was like a Hollywood party and, you know, I was around a bunch of people who conceivably could have been involved in something like that, right? Like I was I was around a group of people who were involved in that kind of, you know, in, in those, um, you know, like sort of... Uh, the entertainment industry. Yeah, the we're, entertainment industry. We were in West Hollywood at a party. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for making that easy. This is one of the challenges of introverted thinking, trying to give you all the information. All right. Anyway, so they told me that, yeah, and, and when I said, oh my gosh, it's one of the best edited movies of all time. That's amazing that your company did that. They totally let me believe that I was right. And I found out later, because I looked for their name, of course, and the name of their company in the credits later because I thought it was cool on that movie and I couldn't find it anywhere. I was like, wait, shouldn't they be in the credits? Like, shouldn't it be editor? I found out later that they had a sound editing company that was subcontracted by another editor on the movie that did some of the sound editing. And I was like, oh, you didn't. It's close enough, right? <laughs> oh, and I, I have to admit, my introverted thinking felt nothing but disdain. I was like, you let me believe a corrupted piece of information just so that I would give you more approval. Like to me, there was like almost nothing more offensive to me. I just found it so offensive. And uh, from that point on, I just like, I, I just can't even be around that person anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm learning forgiveness. I'm into personal development, but even introverted thinking has its standards. <laughs> and it just, it was, it's like something I, it, it's something that I actually had to contend with. Like I have, I'm still trying to make peace with it because I found it to be so offensive. And that's introverted thinking's, um, that's its style. It wants good information and if you give it good information it doesn't matter who you are there's a there's kind of a classic apocryphal tale of Richard Feynman who I believe was somebody who used introverted thinking Richard Feynman was a part of the original Manhattan Project and he was considered one of the greatest minds on quantum physics of all time and there's these apocryphal tales of him just hanging out with anybody at any time, just chewing the fat with janitors all the way up to, you know, the greatest scientific minds of the age. And he never acted like anybody was any different as long as they're as long as they would treat him, you know, talk to him in a real honest way. And it's because it's the information that introverted thinking is placing precedence on. That's the that's the value. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've accomplished in any other way. If your data is good, you have value as a person. And I'll keep coming back. I'll see you as a valuable person. You could be the janitor and you could be a mentor of mine because you're teaching me things I can't find anywhere else. Now, this is very different than extroverted thinking. That's looking at outward markers of success and pass fail. 
they're looking for metrics in the outside world to indicate that somebody is, is you know, that person's valuable. Now, that's not to say extroverted thinking wouldn't see that the janitor is valuable in the capacity of what they're doing, but they might not give them credence. They might not give them, you know, they might not think that that person has a lot of valuable information to share with them because they might not be able to give them ways to accomplish big things, right? Like big projects, which is the information they're looking for. But introverted thinking is looking for all sorts of different pieces of information. It's not just how to get something accomplished. It's anything that would be data that has value. Anything that will allow them to go in and create those, like separate all those conflated thoughts, separate all that bad data from itself. And that's that that's, can be sourced from anywhere. Anybody could say something that will get you rethinking an idea and have you reevaluate it and go, I was totally mistaken about that. I think the, so kind of contrasting it with the extroverted thinking, you know, that effectiveness versus efficiency, you want to want to lean toward effectiveness as an extroverted thinking person. I think with introverted thinking, one of the challenges that a person using this decision-making function could have is that they, I mean, it's hard work to do this, to go through your mind, that source code, and line by line, clean that up. And so once that gets once you get proficient around that and you start to determine how you evaluate the data that you're working with as an introverted thinking person, it is hard work to continue doing that in the future. I mean, that's, it's a lot of hard work. It might give you reward, but sometimes it's rewarding to work with the data you're already familiar with and to add new data in. And so I think one of the challenges here is for you as an introverted thinking person, if you're listening, continually expanding the framework of the information you take in helps you, it actually helps you refine the information you've already been working on. So you're not just stuck in this loop of working on the same information, getting more and more nuanced with it. You're actually adding to the repertoire of things that you can can work through. So that's where it comes into make sure you're expanding your horizons and, and, and opening your frameworks. You're taking more and more information in. And the more you do that, the better you're actually going to get at this process, not just working with the same stuff you've been working with up till now. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Well, it's it's actually introverted thinking can fall for the same... Uh, the same, not ruse, but like challenge that extroverted thinking can when it wants to skip steps. Because the result of extroverted thinking is that you get, you get a return on investment. You get an impact or a result. And if you cheated to get there, right, if you tried to skip steps or you tried to go on the backs of somebody else, then you might have the result, but you might not be ready for it. And you might not be able to actually do anything with it. You might be a corrupted individual in that higher status place or with all that resource. The same challenge can happen to people who use introverted thinking because they want to rush to the result of thinking they're right. Believing that you have good data, that you are the cleanest thought in the room, that you are the person who's providing the best information, that is an intrinsically rewarding experience. And somebody who uses introverted thinking might want to skip steps to get there. They might not want to do the hard work of having to go through the line items and the code you know, meticulously and constantly look for the areas in which they might be wrong. Like introverted thinking when it's at its best is skeptical of its own thoughts. It doesn't think it's right. It's constantly believing that there is something in that information that could be wrong. And in fact, I've noticed that the most the most ruthless and the most meticulous people who use introverted thinking will go through something over and over and over again, like a dozen times before they'll rest into it and go, okay, that's one I can rely on. But as soon as something in some other area of their mind gets discovered to have had corrupted data, if there's a relationship with that thing it's already vetted and called okay, it knows that its responsibility is now to go back to that thing that it went over a dozen times and just make sure that this other piece of corrupted data that may have had some influence on this on this thing that was vetted didn't actually also corrupt that data. So it's not a sense of skepticism to be the smartest person or to assume that you're right all the time. It's a sense of skepticism to ensure that you're not believing anything that doesn't have merit or worth. Now, what ends up happening for introverted thinking is eventually it gets to a point where it realizes that literally nothing, (laughs) nothing is something that you can fully rest into. So then it starts to play with ideas and and look for concepts and and ideas that have valid, you know, merit and worth despite its inability to be proven. And when you get really good at knowing information you can trust and information you can't trust, now it's not about 
it being empirically true, which really very little is, if anything, right? Like we we go, okay, yeah, I'm like in a material world and I'm sitting on a chair and I'm talking to a microphone and like that's as true as I'm going to get. But I could also be a simulation of some video game that somebody's playing in the future to know what it's like to live in 2017. That could be happening and I would never know that. So I'm going to hold that loosely too. So it's not about things that can be empirically proven. It's about things that you can personally trust, information that you can trust and you have seen has given you some return. Like when I believe this and I implement it, I have have like a better way of looking at life. I'm a more you know, rested person. I'm not so anxious. I don't have as much ego. I'm, I feel like my results are better in general. My whole demeanor is better. I'm a happier, more cheerful person. The metrics start, stop becoming about being right. And they start becoming about the quality of human being you are and whether or not you can stay in integrity with yourself. So one of the major differences between introverted thinking and extroverted thinking is that it's looking at the results extroverted thinking, looking at the results, versus introverted thinking, looking at the process. And if you have these two together, both process and result, that's when you have a powerhouse. That's when you're doing very well. Because the process is not always going to be efficient. In fact, the process is very inefficient for introverted thinking. There's a lot of time and effort that goes into that meticulous looking at the code. It is not an inefficient process. But It is a process that has integrity. And integrity is one of the things that extroverted thinking is off, you know, can be missing if it's just looking at the results. If it just wants the impact, it just wants pass fail, it doesn't care two craps about integrity. And so when you have the two of them together, now you have a complete picture, which is why I think both of the thinking processes are so required in our current society. I think that's absolutely true. And I think also the other the other compare and contrast here between extroverted thinking and introverted thinking is the relationship to information. How these two processes, how these two judging functions basically look at information. So extroverted thinking, when a new piece of information comes into its world, new data, new information comes in, often extroverted thinking will categorize it, first of all, and say, is this actionable or is this not actionable information? If it's not actionable information, it usually is disregarded. I mean, it might be cataloged for later a little bit, but it's not really paid attention to. It's looking and scanning for what is actionable information. Because remember, extroverted thinking is looking for applied resource or applied information or applied knowledge. It wants to apply it to an outcome, to the outcome that it wants to see in the world, what works. Whereas introverted thinking, all information is not actionable. Information is valid in its own right. If this piece of information does not have action associated with it, that doesn't matter to introverted thinking. It'll just absorb that and start to work with it and start to clean it up and figure out where the data set is. Yeah, well, the action is internal. Correct. So it's not an external action. So basically what, what happens now in a, in a real life scenario, let's just use this hypothetical situation. Uh, you're, you're driving down the road. I think I've given this example before. You're driving down the road. Someone using introverted or extroverted thinking, excuse me, someone using effectiveness, extroverted thinking is driving a vehicle down the road and a passenger in the car might make a comment like, oh, there's XYZ restaurant to the right over there. And the extroverted thinking person in the front seat might say, oh, that's a piece of information this person's giving me. That's, that must mean they want me to take action on this piece of information, or at least weigh whether or not I will take action on this. So now that extroverted thinking drive, the person that's driving the vehicle might turn toward the, the driveway to that restaurant or ask the person, is that where you'd like to go to eat? And the person that gave that piece of information might say, no, I just was telling you that that restaurant exists over there. And to the extroverted thinking person, it's kind of like, well, why would you tell me a piece of information unless you wanted me to either evaluate it for action or to actually take action on that? And sometimes that can be confusing. Whereas if an introverted thinking person is driving the vehicle along and the, the passenger says, oh, look, there's restaurant XYZ over there. Oh, thank you for thank you for letting me know. And maybe just continues driving. And the person that gave him the information says, well, I actually wanted to eat there. That's why I referenced it. And the introverted thinking person might say, oh, I, I didn't realize that you wanted me to take action on that information. I thought you were just sharing an observation with me, a piece of information that you observed for me to take into account and then to put inside my little brain there with all the other introverted thinking information I have. So that's just a metaphor or like a, an external example of how this might play out in the, in the real world in a daily experience level. Yeah. One of the challenges that introverted thinking has is that because it's not always 
it's it doesn't necessarily look at impact. It has challenge in sharing the the actual gift it brings to the world. It it can it can be baffled when other people are not valuing clean data like it is. And so when it's so process focused and so process oriented that it loses sight of impact, that's when you have TPs that appear to like basically kind of be jerks, right? Because they're trying to share this information and everybody seems to be knocking the taco out of their hand, right? They don't want their gift. And introverted thinking goes, well, screw you guys, right? You guys are all idiots. And then it kind of goes off on its own direction. And that's when it's the sort of the the equivalent to extroverted thinking becoming sort of the petty despot <laughs> that wants to do whatever it wants, right? Like, because it's not process, extroverted thinking is not always process oriented. So it will do whatever it needs to do in order to gain that power, even if it didn't earn it or it's an unsustainable model. Or even if it corrupts data to do so That's sometimes. Exactly. Even if it corrupts data. So both of them have challenges if it's not, if it doesn't understand its own natural limitation. Introverted thinking's natural limitation is that it doesn't think in terms of impact on a practical level. It might think of it conceptually or abstractly, but it's not always implementing the right things to be able to have the impact it wants. And extroverted thinking might think about terms of like processes in the abstract, but it's not focused on making sure those processes are clean. So if you are a person who's trying to determine whether or not you're using you know, introverted thinking or extroverted thinking, these are some of the things that you might want to consider. What When I get information, what am I doing with it? Am I Do I think that information is actionable in the outside world or in the internal world? Am I looking at measurements in terms of what's happening in the outside world and the impact and the result and pass fail? Or am I thinking of it in terms of internalizing it and making sure that my personal scripts are clean and thinking about it in terms of, you know, not not just not just in terms of understanding and awareness and adding it to a repertoire of information, but specifically cleaning up lines of code, ensuring that the way you're thinking and the thoughts that you're thinking are ones that can be trusted by you as an individual. So some of these are, uh, there. this is a deeper dive into how these work. It's not a comprehensive overview. There are other elements to it, but we wanted to give you some of the differences and distinctions that maybe some people miss. I, I know we got to wrap up because we're running out of time, but I do want to just add a couple, like have a little bit of more conversation just for a minute or two here about the compare and contrast. If, if you're on the fence about these two processes, or if you really wanted to understand the nuance of them. Also, I think that introverted thinking sees information as ubiquitous and abundant. So it has no problem sharing information almost freely. And this can get introverted thinking people in trouble sometimes because they share all this information. Other people aren't always responsible with information that you share. And sometimes this can come back to bite you, right? Whereas extroverted thinking almost seems a limitation. There's a limited amount of information and resources. If it's all actionable, that means we can only take action on so many things. So information is power to an extroverted thinking person. There's a lot of maybe withholding information. It doesn't see information as ubiquitous and unlimited or abundant. It sees a limitation to that. And in fact, it knows a little bit about how people use information and weaponize it because quite frankly, there could be a temptation for extroverted thinking to do the same thing. Effectiveness people sometimes are tempted to want to manipulate information to get the result they want. So they know that's possible because they have the ability to do it. So they're careful with what information they give out because they, they're concerned that in the wrong hands, information can be weaponized or misused. So they're much more cautious with their information often. And this is another difference between the two is how they are either free or reserved with the information they share or... Uh, uses currency in a sense in their world. So I think if you're if you are one of these two types, I think you've probably had the experience of this coming up for you in your in your life where maybe you're an introverted thinking person, a TP and you've shared information and people purposely misunderstand you or then latch onto something you said and then and then twist it back to you to say aha, this is the action you meant from that. And you're saying no, I wasn't I wasn't giving you any action at all. I was l simply sharing an abundance of information that I have. And this is the most accurate information I have at the, at the time I'm telling you, please don't corrupt this. And it's probably frustrating to you as a, as a TP when that happens. If you're a TJ and you have a, uh, an insight into how people might weaponize information and you withhold information, you withhold data and you hold your cards close to your vest, so to speak, 
Well, people now don't necessarily know your intent. They only know what you're actually taking action on. You haven't given them full, maybe the full picture of what you fully intend. They don't know your heart. They don't know your mind. They don't know what's going on for you. You're holding your cards so close. People might misunderstand you from an intent level. So it's not so much about them twisting your words back to you. They might think that maybe you have bad intent when you actually have good intent. You're just being very careful so the information is not misused. So these are two ways which maybe if you're a TJ or a TP, this relationship to information can sometimes hijack your experience in your life and it can sometimes it could sometimes create frustration for you. And so I just wanted to make that quick note if you're using one of these processes. So what about you? Are you a TP or a TJ in the Myers Briggs system? And how do you how how is your relationship with introverted thinking or extroverted thinking showing up for you? Are you resonating with this? Is this making sense to you? Is this something that you've seen play out in your life? Have you seen this contrast with relationships in your life with people who use the other attitude of the same thinking process? Let us know. Head over to personalityhacker.com. Leave a message or a comment at the bottom of this podcast. You can't talk. You're the third person in this conversation that does not have a microphone, but your comment can be your microphone. So let us know what that looks like for you. Yeah, you can also join our community of like minds over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack, H-A-C-K. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And of course, if you're feeling particularly giving, you can leave us a rating and review on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Mm -hmm.